Welcome back. All right, so five games tonight in the NHL, and I'm also going to do an update on the whole Arizona situation. That's why I'm wearing my Arizona jersey, too. It's the one that's got my, my name on it uh, for wearing for street hockey, but I thought, no, I want to wear this tonight, and I'll, I'll talk about that, too. But anyways, uh, we're going to start off talking about the Carolina-St. Louis game. Uh, it's Anderson versus Bennington in this one. Uh, Stahl, Taravainen, and Pesci all being rested in this one tonight. So this is where things get interesting because we talk about, well, they've got tougher competition because they're against this team or that team. This is where teams start resting players. Nashville rested players too. So teams exchange rushes. Uh, Canes press at two minutes. The shots are two apiece, three minutes in. Uh, both teams were back checking well early on. Thomas has a rush chance that's held. The Blues press at 8 minutes. Canes draw power play. That becomes a minute and 21 seconds of 4 on 4. Shea has a shot that's caught and held. Everything gets killed off. Uh, shots are 11 to 6 for the Canes with 6.5 minutes left. Dean is absolutely robbed of his first NHL goal. Uh, Saad has a 3 on 1 chance that's held. And then at 17.34, uh, Zach Bolduc gets one. Uh, Letty and Thomas with the assist. It was a nice cross ice pass and buried. So Bolduc stays hot. Uh, but uh, an answer pretty much right away by Carolina at 18.59. Martinuk goes five hole on a rush. Svechnikov with the assist. It's 1-1 one, one after one. Second period. Shots are 2-0 for the Blues at three and a half minutes. They end up getting a power play and they score on it. It's Cairo with his 30th of the season. He gets that one from the right circle. But Shnevich and Thomas with the assist at 5.41. So St. Louis with their second lead. But Carolina answers. Uh, on a rush right after Butchnevich can't get one into the net, he felt like he was slashed on the play. They didn't call it. And at 8.07, Jarvis on that rush that followed scores from Shea and Anderson. So Freddie Anderson with an assist there. Uh, Blues press at nine minutes. The shots are 7-4 to four for Carolina at the half. Drury fans on a prime chance. There's a power play for Carolina. That's killed off. Uh, Faust is denied and close. The Canes press with a minute and a half left, but it's 2-2 two, two after two. Third period. Uh, Natchez fires one wide on a rush. The Canes press at two and a half minutes. The shots are four to one for St. Louis four minutes in. Kairou's denied. The rebound's cleared. We get a power play for the Blues. That lasts 32 seconds and becomes a four on four. Uh, Saad has a rush chance that's saved. And then Slavin during the four on four scores from Ajo and D'Angelo at 7.53. Uh, everything gets killed off from there. Uh, Blues press with four and a half minutes left. Shea has a screenshot that's kicked aside. The goalie pull happens with 2.50 left because, of course, St. Louis... Down by one, they have to win this one if they want to stay alive. Uh, Gensel hits the empty net at 17.20, and then Gensel hits the empty net again at 19.10, this time from Jarvis and Slavin. So Carolina eliminates St. Louis from playoff contention. They go to 51-22-7 with the win. St. Louis 43-33-5. So we now know the top eight teams in the West that have made the playoffs. It's just a matter of in what order. Shots on net, 13-11 Carolina in the first, 19-6 Carolina in the second, 14-10 St. Louis in the third. Final shots, 42-31 for Carolina. Power plays, the Canes 0-3, for three. St. Louis 1-3, for three. the hits 18-8 for St. Louis. Uh, Freddie Anderson, 29 saves on 31 shots. Bennington was excellent as well, 37 saves on 40 shots. All right, next up. Nashville and Chicago. So it's Lankin and versus Soderblom in this one. Nyquist and McDonough being rested by Nashville tonight. Shots are 4-1 to Preds at 3.5 minutes. Hawks press at 4 minutes. We get a power play for Nashville, and they score on it. Uh, Forsberg with his 44th goal, which set a brand new team record for goals. He breaks Duchesne's record from a couple years ago. Evangelista and Novak with the assist at 5.53. So he goes bar down on that one, and a new record is set. Uh, there's a press by Nashville at 8 minutes. Sligert's denied as the Hawks press. The shots are 7-3 to three for Nashville with 8 minutes left. The Hawks press with 6 minutes left. We get a power play for Chicago. That's killed off. Uh, there's a press by Nashville with 2 minutes left. And at 19.01, Sherwood. Soderblom failed to hold on to it. Thought he had it. Didn't. Uh, Sherwood gets the goal from Shen and Stasny. First assist for Luke Shen in a while. And it's 2-0 Nashville after 1. Second period, there's an early power play for the Hawks. That's killed off. At 522, Forsberg makes it 3 0 with his 45th of the season. Uh, the Hawks would press to respond. In fact, they were out shooting Nashville 5 3, seven and a half minutes in. We get a power play for Nashville, and they score on it. At 937, it's Zucker from Sissons and Glass. He roofs one on a net drive. It's 4 0. Uh, Yossi then has a rush chance that save. The shots are 11 7 for Nashville with five and a half minutes left. The Hawks get a power play. That becomes a minute and 31 seconds of five on three. Get a post for Seth Jones, but then during that five on three, they score. 
Uh, Kurashev from Bedard and Tyler Johnson at 16.58, and it was a one-timer from the right circle. Uh, Preds kill off the five on four. Tyler Johnson's denied in the closing seconds. It's four to one Nashville after two. Third period, there's an early power play for the Preds, and they score on it. It's Forsberg with the hat trick goal. O'Reilly and Evangelista with the assists of 137. It was cross crease bass and buried. Uh, there's a press by Nashville then at five and a half minutes. The shots are four to one Nashville seven and a half minutes in. They press again with nine minutes left. Jankowski fires one wide from the slot, and really they controlled a lot of that third period. Uh, things get punchy with 56.9 seconds left. It's four on four coming out of that. Doesn't matter. Your final score is five to one for Nashville. They go to 46 29 and five with the win. With the loss, Chicago 23 51 and five. Uh, shots on net 13 to six Nashville in the first, 14 12 Nashville in the second, 13 8 Nashville in the third. Final shots 40 to 26 for Nashville. Uh, power plays, Nashville saved all three, or scored on all three. Uh, for Chicago, they scored once on the four, and of course, that's the five on three goal. Uh, hits 21 to, to 12 for Chicago. Lankinen saves 25 out of 26. Soderbloom saves 35 out of 40. All right, next up, Arizona and Edmonton. Arizona's Arizona's playing a bit of a different game right now. Uh, so when they came out in Vancouver, they weren't focused that first period, and then the next 40-plus minutes take place, and they were pretty good. Tonight, uh, they got Yeoman's work from Carl Vimelka, and they got goals when they needed him. So it's Vimelka versus Pickard. The Oilers press at two minutes. The shots are one apiece at three minutes. Jersey has a net drive that's held. Dry side Lacane near miss. Ekholm fires one wide, and then on a rush the other way, Josh Doan scores his fourth. Uh, McBain and Michelli with the assist at 520. We get a power play for Edmonton. That's killed off. Uh, the Coyotes press at nine minutes. There's a post for Kane and close. Uh, Keller's then denied from the slot. That puck's held on to. Shots are nine to six for the Coyotes with four minutes left. Uh, Gunther has a rush chance. That's held. The, Co the Coyotes get a power play with 221 left. Cooley's robbed during that. That power play's killed off, but it's one nothing Arizona after one. Second period, Schmaltz has a rush chance that's saved, and then at 149, Henrique scores from Kane and Stetcher. Uh, Oilers press at four minutes, but the shots are four to three for the Coyotes, five minutes in. And at 537, Cooley buries a rebound on a rush. Dersey and Schmaltz with the assists. So Arizona's got their lead back at two to one. Uh, the Oilers then press are kept to the outside. We get a power play for the Coyotes. That's killed off. The Oilers would press in the final minute. They had opportunities, but this is where it becomes kind of the Vimelka show. It's 2-1 to one for Arizona after two. Third period, Nurse scores at 112. Uh, pass to screen and it deflects in as well. Fogel and Kane with the assists on that. Coyotes look to respond. Keller misses one high and close. The shots are 4-0 Edmonton, five minutes in. Uh, net feed to Perry gets picked off. Vimelka's the reason this is staying 2-2, two -two. really is. Uh, the shots are 12-2 to two for the Oilers with eight minutes left. The Oilers press with seven and a half minutes left. The Coyotes press with four left. And in the final minute, the Oilers try to generate chances uh, for that game-winning goal, but they don't get there. We go to overtime. Uh, Keller's denied. The Oilers rush. Uh, Nugent Hopkins has a shot that deflects out. Gunther to Cooley gets picked off. And then at 135, Michelli. Uh, during the game between the Coyotes and the Canucks that I went to, I pointed out Michelli to Yvonne, and I said, he's got a good shot. I wish he'd use it more. He used it here in overtime, and he scores. He wires it. Uh, Michelli from Kessel Ring and Doan at 135. The Coyotes beat both Vancouver and Edmonton. Now they go to Calgary. Uh, they're 35 40 and 5 with the win. With the overtime loss, Edmonton drops to 48 24 and 6, but they move within three points of the lead in the division, and they play Vancouver tomorrow. They still have the game in hand. Shots on net 10 6 Arizona in the first, 15 8 Edmonton in the second, 18 7 Edmonton in the third, 3 to 1 overtime. Uh, shot advantage for Arizona, including the shot that matters. Final shots 40 to 28 for Edmonton. Power plays the Coyotes 0 for 2, Edmonton 0 for 1. Uh, the hits 37 to 18 for Edmonton. Vimelka saves 38 out of 40. Uh, Pickard saves 25 out of 28. So uh, Vimelka had a great game, and for the Coyotes, uh, kind of a big night. So before the game, it was reported that the GM went to the players and basically told them that they're they're go they're gonna move that uh it's it's not all like signed off on yet obviously the whole machinations of how this is going to work are still being ironed out pierre lebrun and others have been talking about that today that oh wait a minute this isn't done done but when when the gm flies in and says you guys are going to get to go to utah and tour the facilities on the 18th 
it's it's pretty much a fait accompli. So the move to Salt Lake City could be announced on April 17th. We'll all pretend we're surprised when it's announced. Uh, the GM told the players that they're they're going to take a tour and and they're going to get you know some help. I I would think the team's really going to help them out with the move th- move too. I have seen people asking, well, couldn't they refuse to go to Salt Lake City? No. Uh, they're signed to a contract with the franchise. If the franchise moves, they move with the franchise. Um, I remember when Atlanta moved to Winnipeg, there might have been players that weren't happy about going to Winnipeg, but I never saw anybody say, I'm not playing for them. Uh, and if anybody quietly goes to uh, GM Bill Armstrong and says, look, I, I'm not all that interested in playing in Utah, I'm sure they'll work on trades for players that may not want to go. Um, also, for anybody who's saying, well, it's a terrible team that's going to Utah, why would they want it? This Coyotes team is way better than people give it credit for. Absolutely. I said before the season, I thought they could finish at 500. They currently sit five games below 500. Uh, I think the future is really bright for the Arizona Coyotes, and I, I feel gutted for Arizona fans. And I know people are going to say, oh, what fans? Oh, there's no real fans in Arizona. Um, but there are. There absolutely are. I remember the disrespect Vancouver got when it was an NBA team as well, when players wouldn't some wouldn't play in Vancouver and they refused to play at all. And um, some fans would say, oh, there's no real fans in Vancouver. And when the attendance dropped, that was proof that even though the team was crap, that's that didn't matter. It was proof Vancouver wasn't a basketball market. So um, I, I, I do feel for Coyote fans. I've seen some comments from fans that they're, they're going to tune out the NHL because... You know, they've lost their team. I get it. I do. Um, I do hope people stick around and, and follow. The The plan seems to be to bring the team back. The problem is, what I've been seeing online as well, is that with the way this has played out, Alex Marwello, there's there's no good faith with him and the fan base. It's gone. Uh, when he came in as the owner, there was a lot of promises he made. He has not kept those promises, and now the team is packing its bags and going to Utah. Uh, and I feel bad for people who work for the team. Uh, I feel bad for the families that are affected by this. And, you know, no matter how you may feel about Arizona as a market at all, or Phoenix or Tempe or wherever, uh, the reality is this is going to hurt a lot of people. So um, while I'm, I'm interested to see how the whole thing with Utah is going to work, and uh, I'll be talking about that over the coming week, I am also sensitive to the fact that Coyote fans are kind of ticked off um hopefully some of the coyote fans will stick around and 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 watch my stuff i'm sad i didn't get to go to the mullet and watch a game because it sounds like it was a lot of fun and the other thing too is that like those tickets weren't cheap like the tickets for the mullet were generally not on the cheaper side they were charging a a a fair amount for them the last time i looked so you know fans have been coming out and and they've been told we're going to play at the mullet and then we're going to get this brand new arena and then the brand new arena didn't happen and as recently as monday they were sending out these renderings on the new building and what it was going to look like and now you may still get the building i i don't know i don't know how this is going to work because they still want to bid on on the land in june i think after the announcement comes out whether it's april 17th or 18th that the team's moving to utah it'll be very interesting to see if Maruello and the people who are in charge of all this and the land bid, if their tone changes. If they say, you know what, um, maybe we won't bid on that land. Maybe maybe this doesn't work for us and we'll look at something else. If that comes out, then yeah, it's curtains for any thought of going back to Arizona. But if they keep up with the bid and if they win the bid, hockey likely goes back to Arizona in some form. Uh, they the league wanted to make sure that they didn't just play in the mullet for five years. That was not that was a non-starter for the league, and so we are where we are. But it looks like they're going to Utah. And that being said, and again, apologies to to fans that are are affected by this. I think it's too bad. But I have to say, the Coyotes players, the way they've played the last two games, fantastic. And that Logan Cooley, he's going to be a star in the National Hockey League, absolutely. So. So Lake City's getting a good young team with a lot of young star players, and I I think I think this is going to be uh, going to be an interesting time. That being said, I do need to change boards and resume the review. All right, so Calgary and Anaheim, Wolf versus Gibson. Uh, the shots were two nothing for the Flames at four minutes. Kind of a quiet start to this one. Uh, we get a power play for Anaheim, and that leads to a shorthanded goal on a turnover a tic-tac-toe play Majapani scores from Pahal and Sharon Govich at 554. 
Uh, the Flames then finish the kill. The shots are 6-2 to two for Calgary at 8.5 minutes. The Ducks go back to the power play. That becomes a 4-on-4. Four four. Everything's killed off there. And at 11.53, Kadri makes it 2 nothing from Pospisil and Shillington. So 2 nothing for the Flames after 1. Second period, early press by Calgary. Uh, the Ducks then get some pressure 2.5 minutes in. Pahal fires one wide as the Flames get some pressure. Uh, the Flames draw a power play and they score on it. Kuzmenko jams one in. Gibson almost had it. Kadri and Uyghur with the assists at uh, 544. I believe this was Kadri's 900th game tonight. Uh, goalie interference challenge on the play fails, so the Flames get a power play out of that. The Ducks do kill that off. The shots are 9-1 to one Calgary, 9.5 minutes in. Flames go back to the power play. That's killed off. And at 1828, the Flames score anyways. Zeri uh, roofs a backhand in close. Huberto and Hunt with the assists there. It's 4 nothing Calgary after 2. But it's Calgary. Uh, third period, early press by the Flames. Ducks get pinned down a bit. Colangelo, who's making his NHL debut tonight, uh, has a one-timer that's held. And then on the face-off that follows, uh, Colangelo buries a puck that's behind Wolf for that first NHL goal. Lundestrom and Gudis with the assist at 2.54. It's 4-1 to until 6.13 when Frankie Vitrano scores. Uh, Zegers and Lacombe with the assists. And then at 7.01, uh, Zellweger puts one pass to screen and... In off Mackenzie Wieger's leg. Terry and Fowler with the assist there. Suddenly it's 4-3. to three. Game's getting interesting. Flames press with 8 minutes left, but with 6.02 left, they also get a power play. And Kuzmenko, I have to say, I think this is Kadri's goal. So I'm just going to say I think this is Kadri's goal. I think it's, if it hasn't already been changed, I think it's going to be uh, Kuzmenko even set up post-game. Because they said, oh, you got a hat trick. And he said, no, no, he didn't. Kadri had that goal. So I, I do think that's going to be Kadri's. Kuzmenko from Huberto and Kadri at 14.20. Uh, if it's changed, it'll be Kadri from Kuzmenko and Huberto. And then at 17-19, uh, on a rebound for what currently at the time I was writing up the board is a hat trick, Kuzmenko scores from Pospisil and Uyghur to make your final score 6-3. to three. And I'm going to say when Kuzmenko has a big game like this, I see all the, oh, you know, if he was still in Vancouver, yada, yada, yada. I'm just, I'm glad he's being successful. I like Kuzmenko, so it's nice to see him getting goals. I understand it's Calgary, but I'm just glad to see he's getting the chance. If he was in Vancouver... Uh, he still doesn't back check. He still wouldn't be getting ice time. He wouldn't be a 20 goal scorer. So kudos to him for getting to 20 goals. Whether it was here with the goal that could change to Kadri, I'll pick that up in a minute, or whether it's here where he buries a rebound. So uh, the Flames go to 36 38 and 5 with the 6 to 3 win. The Ducks drop to 26 49 and 5, and this was the finish of their home schedule for the season. Shots on net 9 5 Calgary in the first, 10 5 Calgary in the second, 12 to 8 Anaheim in the third. Final shots 27 to 22 for the Flames. Power plays Calgary 2 for 5. Anaheim 0 for 2. Hits 22 to 21 for Calgary. Uh, Wolf saved 19 out of 22. Gibson 21 saves on 27 shots. And yet, I thought Gibson had a decent game. All right, that being said, last game of the night. The Wild getting destroyed by the Vegas Golden Knights. So it's Flurry versus Thompson. I, I saw uh, people I'm actually friends with on Facebook that are Vegas fans uh, from my first trip to Vegas. Uh, actually feeling kind of sad for Flurry. The the body language. He he can't hide when he's disappointed with things, but you could tell he was fighting it tonight. Rossi's tonight is the wild press. We get a power play for the wild, and that leads to a shorthanded goal. Uh, Roy scores that one from Eichel at 255. That's the first career shorthanded goal for Nick Roy. How? He's a good defensive forward. He's your third line forward. He should be out there killing penalties. He he clearly is able to get to the net. Hopefully he gets more shorthanded time. Uh, Vegas finishes the kill, but the shots are 5-2 to two Minnesota at 5 minutes. Erickson X denied and close, and then at 6-21, Dorfiev scores from Theodore. Uh, the Wild Press are kept to the outside. We then get a power play for Vegas, and they score on it. Eichel makes it 3 nothing. Uh, that's from Hannafin and Stevenson at 8-35, and I wasn't taking a lot of notes at that point because I'm like, this game looks like it's done. Uh, 2 left. Vegas gets a power play. That's killed off. It's 3-0 Vegas after 1. Second period, Vegas presses at 2 minutes. The Wild then gets some pressure at 5 minutes. In fact, the shots were in their favor, 3-2 at 6 minutes. Uh, they end up getting a power play, and Huznet Dinov gets his first NHL goal. Uh, Faber and Johansson with the assists at 7:42. Uh, the fans then call one. The referee doesn't, but shortly thereafter, he does give Vegas power play. That becomes a 5-on-3. Uh, during the 5-on-4, so not during the 5-on-3, it was a very brief 5-on-3, uh, Marcheseau with a one-timer from the slot scores. Stevenson and Hannafin with the assists at 13 minutes and 12 seconds. I believe that's the 42nd for Marcheseau, uh, 43 being the mark that was set by William Carlson that first year for Vegas, so he's close. But yeah, that makes it 4-1 to one after 2. Third period early jump for the Wild. Eichel has a rush chance that saved. Vegas presses, and at 2:27, Hurdle 
Barry's his first as a member of the Golden Knights. Uh, a rebound uh, is his first goal and all that. Uh, White Cloud and Stevenson with the assist. So Stevenson with three helpers tonight. Uh, Vegas presses for another. The shots are 7-3 to three Vegas at 7 minutes. At 7.13, though, Hartman, uh, during a delayed call, uh, he puts one in off Hannafin. Boldy and Brodeen with the assists. So that makes it 5-2. Uh, to two. Uh, Vegas presses at the half, and eventually they would score at 10.49. Uh, Carlson scores from Cotter. It's nice to see Cotter on the board. At 13.55, Kolasar then buries a rebound to make it 7-2. to two. Roy and Dorofiev with the assists. We then get a power play for the Wild. That's killed off. And your final score is 7-2, thus the No Mercy Magnet. With this win, the Vegas Golden Knights clinch a spot in the playoffs. And, of course, St. Louis was out. 43-28-8 uh, is the record for Vegas currently. Uh, the Wild 37-33-9. And, and, of course, they were eliminated a while ago. Shots on net, 11-7 Minnesota in the first, 7-5 Minnesota in the second, 18-9 Vegas in the third. So they locked it down in the third. Final shots, 30-27 to for the Golden Knights. Power plays, Minnesota 1 for 3, Vegas 2 for 4. The hits, 20-14 to for Minnesota. Fleury saved 23 out of 30. Uh, if his career is winding down with this, like, his numbers this year have not been not been fantastic. And and it, it was it wasn't a lot of fun watching him just get lit up like this. Uh Thompson saves twenty five out of twenty seven at the other end. So uh yeah, for Minnesota, uh they're playing again tomorrow against San Jose. Uh for Vegas, of course, uh they got some more games coming up, but they don't play tomorrow. So let me know your thoughts on these games in the comment section below or the whole move to Utah thing. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you haven't done so already. Thank you guys so much for all your support. I will talk to you again soon.